Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Below the Yellow Line podcast. A very special guest coming on the show today, a guy that kind of represents my nostalgia for the sport a little bit. So, Joey, if you would, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, my name's Joey Coulter. I've been uh, racing for a long time now. I was actually joking around with uh, somebody where I've I finally reached the uh, the age and the years of experience where I can start telling old guy stories. <laughs> uh, so it's uh but i've been real fortunate been able to drive a lot of race cars at a lot of different racetracks and a lot of different series and uh, i've had some had some success in just about everything which is great and uh, it's been a it's been an awesome uh, awesome career so far yeah you've been able to race all over you've been able to race so many different disciplines um and that's really cool to you know your skill is kind of has kind of translated over um, where I know you from most though, and so because I was kind of getting into the sport right as you were kind of, you know, in the thick of it in your kind of NASCAR prime, uh, you were a championship favorite in the truck series and from the early 2010s about to 2014. Um, I remember watching you, I think with RCR, I think it was the year that you nearly mm-hmm. won the championship, yeah. um, in yep. 2012. So take me through it, you know, as someone who uh, has never been a part of a NASCAR championship battle and never will be. Was there a lot of pressure or was there no pressure? I mean, what what was that like each and every week stepping into the truck? Uh, so the interesting part was, um, and I'll, I'll back it up to the year before that too, um, because it was two very similar uh, battles, I would say, but just two completely different trophies. Um, so the first year, you know, 2011 was my rookie season in the truck series. And uh, there was, I don't want to say pressure, but there was a trend going right so austin dillon my teammate in 2011 he was rookie of the year in 2010 um so right off the bat it was all right joey your 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 goal is to gain experience gain respect um you know get the performance up where it needs to be but the the main goal is to be the 2011 rookie of the year and keep that trend going for rcr and uh so i was like all right cool let's let's go for it and um that was one of the i don't don't know if it still stands or people still see it that way, but that was one of the toughest rookie classes in NASCAR for a long time. Um, and it was a tough battle. Like there was, uh, I think five of us going into Homestead that had a, a shot at it. I think there was three or four of us in that class that, that really did have a shot at winning it. Um, and then it came down to a couple of us right there at the end. And then, um, we got the r- rookie battle one in 2011, which was really cool. And uh, then basically going into 2012, that was the same group I was racing for the championship. <laughs> but, um, so it was uh, it was really neat because you had you had a lot of very talented drivers with all about the same level of experience at that level. Um, so we'd all driven thousands of laps, um, but never on that stage. Uh, so that was really cool a lot of fun um going into 2012 um we obviously felt like because of our momentum from 2011 we had a legitimate shot at winning a championship um between the equipment the people at rcr like it was it was all there austin won it in 2011 so again it was like all right let's keep this trend trend going and uh to start off 2012 we kind of got behind like we had good strong runs but it took us all the way until august to to get our first win, um, which was tough. Um, but from that point on, we were the underdog, right? Like we didn't have the points. We didn't quite have all of that buildup. Um, but from August, so basically from the week that we won Pocono to Homestead that year, we scored more points than anybody in NASCAR period across all the series. So we came on super, super strong. I think the last 10 races, I had nine, nine or 10 top fives in the last, 10 races like it was it was a huge streak it was so great um and honestly like i never we never point race. we never felt like we had a shot at the championship because we just felt like we had to have that come from behind attitude we had to pass trucks we had to win another race we had to you know keep nailing those top threes and uh and we got close we were so close um I think it was like 13 points or something. And then um, I remember it was a few years later, I think maybe 2015 when, or 2014, whenever they started doing the chase format in 
in all three series. Um, somebody tagged me in a tweet and they were like, if, if this point system, they went back like five years or something. And like, if this point system had been implemented yeah. back then, we would have won the championship by almost a hundred points yeah. um, because of that run. But um, it was definitely a cool year. Um, I tell, I do a lot of driver coaching now and, and consulting and mentoring. And I tell all those guys, like, you know, I look back at those years in the truck series and 2012, I had everything I needed to be the most successful in my career, but I didn't know how to use, I didn't understand how to use all that stuff. You know, it wasn't till 2014, you know, which ended up being my last year in the truck series that I actually, I knew how to use tools. I knew how to use the people and work with the people better. I, I got myself way better. Um, and that's, that's the big thing I preach to the, to the younger guys I work with now is like, look, learn all this stuff now while it's easy. Don't try to learn it when it's hard because it's hard and it takes up all your time and, and trying to pick up a skill that's that important in a high pressure situation when it means a lot is, is really, really hard to do. Absolutely. It's great that, you know, there are people like you that have been in those, you know, high pressure, high leverage situations that are helping out kind of the youth of our sport um, to be better equipped for the future. Um, and that's just, that's great uh, for me as a fan to see. So 2012, we were just talking about how, you know, that year was a, a great year for you. I mean, you were so consistent, you know, you scored the most points in, in all the national series uh, towards the end of the stretch. But you talked about your struggles at the beginning of the year, kind of how it took you a little bit to find your footing. Uh, this necessarily isn't on you, but the one thing that, you know, I remember about that season, it's probably second on the list behind that Pocono win, just because you were so excited to get that win. But Daytona, I mean, I'm sure you've had that brought up a lot. Uh, you know, it, it's a crash that, you know, I've seen a million times. It's a crash that you've probably replayed in your mind a million times, you know, if you remember it. But just kind of take us through, you know, what you remember about that wreck, that moment in time, and, and just kind of your, your thoughts on it. Uh, so, I mean, it was, um, it, the whole race in general was actually uh, probably one of the best super speedway races that I'd ever put together. Um, I uh, I used to joke around, um, I used to talk with Ryan Newman a little bit, um, and I used to joke around that I thought I was the worst super speedway racer than he was. Um, <laughs> if he, he has awful luck, you know, like he, he's, he has awful luck. I don't think he's a big fan of him, but... I feel like if I would have kept racing, I think I could have done worse than him um, when it came to super speedways. But um, that race in particular, uh, we had a super fast truck. Um, I was really, really happy with everything. I could push really well. That was the that was the first year that we did the tandem drafting, um, which was absolutely insane. Uh, but I liked it. Like I just I ate it up. And so we had a really good push truck and I figured that out and I just started pushing people and we got up into the, the top four there. Um, that last restart, I was behind uh, Todd Bodine and Todd and I got along really well. He was, him and Ron Hornaday were both sort of my mentors in 2011. Um, so I knew there was a lot of trust between Todd and I. So, uh, you know, I got the word from his spotter through my spotter to, to push like hell. And uh, I, I didn't get the restart that I wanted, um, but it kind of worked out because by the time I did get reconnected with Todd, everybody else had already kind of lost their momentum. So when we came back around to take the white, I was glued to his bumper. I was like, all right, by the time we get around to the back stretch, it's gonna be me or Todd. Like I had that feeling and the next thing I know, I was pointed the wrong direction and felt the back of the truck pick up. And at that point, I just grabbed the bottom of the steering wheel, put both feet on the brake pedal for some reason, and uh, and just held on. And it was literally just, you know, sky ground, sky ground, sky ground. And then I landed. Um, I was so I remember being I was so happy I landed on my wheels and not upside down. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it was wild. I mean, it, and it just it really it tore our truck up. It messed Ron Hornaday's truck up really bad. Um, and, uh, you know, thankfully everybody was OK. We all got out, walked away. Um, definitely more exciting than I wanted it to be. 
Um, but I, uh, I, I hurried up, you know, when I got out of the infield care center, I hurried up, got back to the motor home and, uh, found some ibuprofen and uh, turned on Sports Center and I made Sports Center that night. So I was tickled to death about that. Um, you know, the, the saying is go big or go home. So we uh, we at least went big. Absolutely. They always talk when you go to Daytona, you know, for any of the three national series starting off, you always want to start your year off on the right foot. Start it off with a bang and you started it off with about the biggest bang that you <laughs> possibly could. I mean, I don't there's no grander entrance in my opinion than flying into the catch fence but thankfully uh you were okay um and thankfully we've had plenty uh, of advancements and safety as well that have kind of um hope stuff like that to, to end on the right foot um mm -hmm. yeah. taking from one of your probably one of your worst memories of 2012 to one of your best how special was that win in pocono i was just watching that race the other day and uh to prepare for this and you know i was just seeing I mean, we, we really hadn't seen a truck like that, or we, sorry, we really hadn't seen the truck series at Pocono that much before that. I might be wrong, but I feel like it was relatively new then. Um, but but seeing you win that race, and you won it by like 20 truck lengths. I mean, nobody was really close to you. How cool did it feel to see that checkered flag and almost kind of like ride off into the sunset for your first one of that season? It it was really cool, and there's, there's so many stories behind that race that, you know at the time never really got talked about because it was uh it was a tactical advantage if you want to call it that so um my my hero my 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 genius this whole time has always been harold holly and he was my crew chief when i raced arca he was my crew chief at rcr at kbm um and then he was a uh, one of the managers and consultants uh basically when i was at gms in 2014 um, he's run all of my dirt stuff. He's in charge of this modified program we run now. Um, but Harold and I, and it's part of, part of what I think got us a little bit behind in the beginning of the year, but Harold has never been the kind of crew chief to do things everybody else's way just because <laughs> he's, he's an innovator. If anybody does their homework on Harold Holly, there are, are pages and pages of rule books that have been written because of him. <laughs> and and that's that's what's special about Harold is it's never, you know, he's never blatantly cheating, right? He's just finding new ways. Exactly, to creating new fast. rules. Yeah, and sometimes it 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 comes out as a new rule. But uh, so what what we did at Pocono basically is you know we had these we had ride height rules and and deck height rule, right? So at most of the intermediate race tracks and the short tracks you were you were minimized in your front height and maximized in your rear height to get all the most downforce you could well with Pit, pocono and michigan being repaved harold's first thought was well these places are going to have so much more grip than they've ever had we got to get some drag out of these trucks so harold basically went to work on these trucks and figured out how to get everything to handle correctly get the front suspension where it should be but with the rear height right so almost like we would run on a super speedway right you tail down far as far as you can <laughs> right so it was all within the rules it was just it took a lot of work in the front ends to make everything line up because when you're dropping the back that much it changes all kinds of things right not to get over complicated but it was a lot of work harold figured it out and we said all right we're gonna do it at pocono and uh, it was a big meeting, big conversation, because if it didn't work, it was going to be an awful weekend, right? And we, we were kind of prepared for that. So we kept working on it in practice. Um, at one point, we talked about just abandoning, like just changing our, our package, going back to our normal deal. Um, but I was like, no, let's stick with it. We got to stick with it. Harold still felt like he could fix it. Um, and we just kept tuning on the truck during the race. And once we got out into clean air, it... It dominated like um we cleared traffic there on that last restart and i was able to just to just go as hard as i had gone the entire race and uh and that changed to me that changed the truck series because we did it again at michigan and and should have won that race too like we had so much more speed um and then now like you know nascar has moved the ride height rules around and made it a little bit easier but now everybody runs minimized ride heights everywhere and and again like it's that to me looking back at it like winning the race was cool but 
being able to work with somebody like Harold that had that sort of forethought and that that kind of innovation and knowledge to go do that and then hand you know some 22 year old kid the truck and say hey this is way different I don't know if it's going to work but we're going to go try it um, and then it worked. Uh, so it was super cool. Um, it was my first win. There was a bunch of guys on my crew. It was their first win. Um, my whole family was there. My uh, girlfriend at the time is now my wife. She was there. So it was a huge day. Um, awesome moment. And uh, the, the only disappointing thing was I never never got to do it again. I got close a couple times. But, um, but yeah, it was, a, it was an awesome weekend for sure. Well, it sounds like after that, that Harold Hawley needs to do a DNA test and see if there's any uh, relation to Junior Johnson in there. Because there might be like a, you know, long lost, you know, fifth cousin 17 times removed or something <laughs> from what I'm hearing. But that's, you know, that's the awesome thing. And I always say that, you know, part of the appeal to NASCAR is the people and the, the cars, the speed. But there's so many great stories in the sport, like the one you just shared. You know, a lot of people just see a, a normal truck race in the summer of 2012. But it's great that you're able to bring uh, stories like that, um, especially, you know, of your first win, you know, such a special moment uh, in your career. Uh, we talked Absolutely. a lot about what you've done after you got to the truck series, but that was a long journey for you. When did you know that you kind of first wanted to race in any professional capacity? Um, I mean, I, I, so I started fooling around in go-karts when I was eight. And uh, after that, it just kind of like, you know, I was doing other, playing other sports at the time. Like, I think I was doing baseball and soccer. And I started racing and I was like, all right, well, I really don't want to do baseball anymore. I'd rather go practice on Wednesday night, you know, than go to baseball. So we stopped doing baseball and then it got to where, you know, soccer season came back around and there was some soccer games I had to miss if I wanted to go race on Saturdays. And I was like, yeah, I kind of would rather go to the racetrack than play soccer because I'm not very good at it, can't run. Um, so around the time I was like 12, I pretty much figured out that I wasn't really good at anything else. Like I could do this, I could race, you know, I could do this go-kart thing and I could win. And we were winning championships by then. And uh, that was kind of it. Then the next step was stock cars. and. You know, I think there's a difference between saying, okay, I want to be a professional race car driver and then getting to the point where you realize you might actually be able to do it. <laughs> um, I always wanted to do it, but I don't think I ever really thought I had a shot until I got to working with Harold in the ARCA series when we started in 2009. Um, we were able to really turn things around. Um, I hadn't had a very good year in a stock car before that point. Um, and uh, Harold got us pointed in the right direction. I started really learning a lot more about how to race, how to drive, especially big, you know, heavy stock cars. Um, and then guys like Randy Renfro, who were also a part of that, um, got me in more late model races. So I basically just like tripled my seat time within the course of a couple years. And at that point, I started to think, okay, maybe maybe we've at least got a shot. And then uh, I got my phone call from, from RCR and um, that all kind of hit me. So it, I always wanted to do it. I think by the time I was six or seven, I could have told you I wanted to be a race car driver, but up until up until late 2010, it, it wasn't really a, a reality until then. Yeah, well, it's, it's great to hear, you know, again, another great story of, you know, another driver, uh... Know, getting a chance with RCR too. It's funny, you know, Clint Boyer, when he first got a call from Richard Childers, he thought it was a prank. Did you think it was a prank call or did you know that it was actually RC on the other end of the line? I, I didn't think it was a prank um, necessarily because I, I got a call from the, the, the nice lady that worked the front desk who I actually knew from short track racing. Oh, okay. So when I answered the phone and I heard her voice, I was like, why is she calling me and why did she say RCR? And, and uh, you know, so she's like, you know, we'd like to try to set up a meeting for you to come up here and talk to Richard about, you know, your plans for next year. And uh, I, I just, I couldn't believe it. I was like, well, you, you just tell me when you want me there and I'll be there. Um, and uh, so we, we set up a meeting and uh, I called my dad and 
He's like, yeah, I just got an email. He's like, they called you? I'm like, yeah, I just hung up. Like, we got to go. So we, uh, I was at, going to UNC Charlotte at the time. Um, my parents said uh, we're just starting to move to North Carolina. So we, we hurried up and went up there and sat down and talked it out. And uh, a couple weeks later, I was getting fitted for a fire suit. That's awesome. That's incredible. One phone call, you know, can really, especially in sports and in NASCAR, can really change somebody's life and change somebody's career. Um, that's great. Well, Joey, I think that's all the questions I had for you. So thank you for coming on the show and, and I mean, taking us through a full season of your career and kind of your life uh, leading up to that, telling us some great stories uh, about your crew chief. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show and, and we, we really appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me anytime. Absolutely.